Hello, everybody. Sorry to interrupt great conversations, um, but in the interest of respecting your time, we want to get started. Uh, my name is Steve Nash. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Director of Anthropology and the Avenir Conservation Center uh, here at the museum. That is Dr. Chris Petrello, our new-ish Curator of Anthropology. Um, and today we want to share with you a presentation on what has been called the Vigongo Affair, Ancestors, Museums, and Serendipity. Um, this is one of many pop-up talks that the Science Division does over the course of the year. Paula, when is the next one? September 5th. September 5th, bye. Very cool. So Dave Krause, who is sitting over there, September 5th, 1 p.m., continuing our work over in the other hemisphere, so Africa, Kenya, Madagascar. Um, what I want to do today is share with you the long, convoluted story of how I and we got to this moment. In 2019, a ceremonial ha handover of a Kikongo, the word Kikongo is the singular for Vigongo, which is the plural for these um, wonderful artifacts uh, that are also the physical embodiment of an honor honored person's soul. Um, but that is me and Dr. Jimby Katana on the left there um, engaged in a ceremonial handover of ancestors to elders, knowledge keepers of the Mijikenda in coastal Kenya. This story goes back a long, long ways, but I want to give you a, a quick not even refresh or a quick lesson on Vigongo 101. These are anthropomorphic figures that are that can be up to about six feet tall. They can also be much smaller. Um, geometric designs, oftentimes some textiles, paints and things on them, but they're carved out of termite resistant hardwood in honor of elder men who are members of the Gohu Society. So it's not every elder gets a Vigongo, but if you're a member of the Gohu Society, this honorific society, you can have a Kikongo carved in your honor after you die. It's an incredibly expensive proposition. It can take up to a year's worth of income to carve one of these things and then present it to the community. So this is not a trivial event to, to have a Kikongo carved for you. They are erected either in sacred forests or on the homestead of your relatives, and they're not to be moved thereafter. If you move them, if you disturb them in any way, shape, or form, it interrupts the spirit journey and does all kinds of damage to the individual, to the community, uh, to the world. Um, and so like to sort of analogous to totem poles in the Northwest Coast, they're supposed to decay in place. Seven, uh, so Mijikenda means nine tribes. Seven of those Mijikenda tribes carve Vigongo. And these things started to be stolen. Uh, some would say that they were purchased legitimately, uh, but the purchase was happening under duress. It was happening under nefarious circumstances. So I'm just gonna say they were stolen in the 1970s and 1980s. And much of their distribution in American museums can be attributed to one specific gallery in Los Angeles. 400 Vigongo can be really traced through this one gallery in Los Angeles. And they were donated to, I would call, unsuspecting museums like the Denver Museum of Nature and Science by Hollywood dignitaries and stars. So the, some of the names that have, that have been associated with these donations, Gene Hackman and Art Linson, the producer, are the ones who gave the Denver Museum of Nature and Science 30 Vigongo in the 1980s. Um, Shelley Hack, Linda Evans, Steven Spielberg, the list goes on and on and on. And the, what's m even more troubling than the fact that these things were stolen and then purchased through a singular gallery and then given to the museums is that we found no record that any of those Hollywood dignitaries, actors, producers, and so on, ever took possession of Vigongo. They never had them in their private collection. So on the one hand, they could argue, well, they're pieces of art. I'm an art collector. Therefore, I've got a legitimate right to hold these things. There's no record that anybody ever took possession of them. They went straight from the gallery to the unsuspecting museum. I have a word for that. It's called money laundering. It's tax evasion. It was a tax deduction that these folks got. Um, and they were doing it with people's souls. Why is that not working? There we go. So, 2006, I got here. 2007, Chip Colwell, prior curator of anthropology, got here. And together with the rest of the staff, we put together this aspiration statement. Not a mission statement, not a vision statement, an aspiration statement that we wanted to curate the best understood collection in North America. 
and the most ethically held anthropology collection in North America. That guided some of our work going forward. Our published repatriation philosophy, which was adopted by the Board of Trustees, agreed that repatriation is a human rights issue. We used the term repatriation at the time. Now we're differentiating between repatriation and voluntary returns. Repatriation really is what's happening under the law in many instances. Voluntary returns are just, here you go. We're, we are doing this because it's the right thing to do. Um, but we believe that voluntary returns are also a human rights issue. Doesn't mean that we're gonna give back the entire collection. It doesn't mean blah, blah, blah. It just means that we are going through the collection with an eye towards ethically holding uh, objects in the collection and that returns are something that we will actively engage in if necessary. We also published these values as driving our work back in 2007, and we had justice in front of diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. And again, that was adopted in the ethics policy by the Board of Trustees at the time. We also made a decision in 2007 to get out of the human remains business. And I say that not to be crass, but just to say what it is. We did not want to be curating people in the absence of informed consent. And if you talk to the Midji Kenda, <clears throat> a Kikongo, as I said, is the embodiment of a dead person's soul. Does that mean if we curated Vigongo, we were cur curating human remains? What do you think? See some nods? You could also make the argument that it's not because the soul is intangible and so on, but what we believed and what we led guide our work is that we were curating human remains and that we shouldn't be doing that. And so we started trying to work to repatriate Vigongo. This is the gallery, of an old photograph of, of the gallery in Los Angeles where these Vigongo came. The owner of this gallery, Ernie Wolf, published a book on Vigongo, a best, not a best selling book, but a, a, an easily available book on Vigongo in 1990 in which he makes the argument that it's perfectly legitimate to traffic these things as if they're art. Um, he didn't have any moral compunction. He didn't hold, he didn't accept the argument that, the, that these were um, people's souls. He just said that they're pieces of art and so he sold them. Now this is where the story gets absolutely crazy. Um, and the details don't specifically matter, but I want you to keep the word serendipity in mind. In 1985, so this is after these things had started being stolen, <clears throat> Dr. Monica Udvardi and John Mitsanze, who was Midji Kenda, and Linda Giles had been doing work in coastal Kenya with the Midji Kenda. 1985, she photographs Vigongo in um, Festus Tingu's homestead. She takes photographs in these things. Those of you who weren't around in 1985, uh, and for those of you who were around in 1985, you will remember that you took photographs in a camera and then you took the film to a place and they developed the film and they brought it back and you looked to see whether or not your pictures were any good. Well, coastal Kenya didn't have a photo mat. Look it up if you've never heard of a photo mat. Um, they didn't have any photo mats, so Monica took her roll of film back to Nairobi where she could get it developed, and she got it developed. And then she went back down to Khalifi and back down to Midjikenda land, and she went up to Festus's house, and she said, check it out, I've got photographs of your Vigongo, and he burst into tears. And in the month that she had been gone, his Vigongo, his ancestors were stolen. Thankfully, she had photographs of him, but the damage was done. His ancestors were gone. Then... In 1991, six years later, she goes to a conference at Illinois State University in which Linda, G I'm sorry, Linda Giles was not involved here. It was just John Mitsanze and, and Monica Udvardi. Monica Udvardi goes to a conference at Illinois State University. Linda Giles, who also does work in this area, gave a presentation and she's doing it with old school slides, 35 millimeter slides, cha-ching, and this image goes up. And she's talking about Vigongo, and Monica Udvardi looks at this and says, holy smokes, that, those are the Vigongo from Festus's homestead. She recognized them six years later in central Illinois, and she goes up to Linda afterwards and says, What's, where is this thing from? It turns out it was at the Illinois State University Museum, and the other one was at Hampton University in Philadelphia? Is that where Hampton is? No, Virginia. So two. <clears throat> So Linda and Monica and John start working and it takes them several years, but in 1999, thereabouts, the two Vigongo that Monica had seen at Festus's homestead, and then six years later, they finally went home. Unbelievable serendipity. If Monica Vardy gets up and goes to lunch while Linda Giles is presenting, this doesn't happen, right? It just doesn't. Um, so uh, here is the, the two Vigongo. Festus is not in these pictures, but those are the two Vigongo. 
um, that got repatriated from Illinois State University and from Hampton Museum. These guys are standing in the cage that the National Museum of Kenya built to preserve those Vigongo. So they're re-erected out on the landscape, but they're put into a cage. Problematic in so many ways, but this is what happened. This is the publication from 2001. Folks were happy to get their ancestors back. So, stage was set here at the museum for us to begin addressing um, the issue of our Vigongo. Um, and we worked and worked and worked for several years, didn't have any luck. You know, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, internet is not terribly developed. We tried to reach out to colleagues at the university, uh, universities in Kenya, at the National Museum of Kenya, didn't get any response. And then we realized that Denver and Nairobi are sister cities. They're in the sister cities program. And so we went to Albus Brooks, our city, the museum city council person over there on the left, who then went to Mayor Michael Hancock, um, and we got the acting Kenyan ambassador from Washington here, plus two Khalifi government officials to come in, and we signed a declaration saying that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science was going to repatriate these Vigongo. Boom, it hits the New York Times. We get a, um, a great article in the New York Times. We start hearing from other people saying, we want to send our Vigongo back with you, and so on. We, these things cleared customs. They went out to the Denver International Airport, and then we got word that the, National, that the Kenyan Revenue Authority wanted to charge us a $40,000 import tariff. We had valued these things at the appraised value of $1,000. We put on the paperwork that they were therefore worth $40,000, and the Kenyan Revenue Authority said, great, pay us $40,000, and these things can go home. Uh, clearly, we weren't going to do that. I'm from Chicago. I understand bribery and extortion, but let's be reasonable, folks. Call it $2,000. Call it $5,000. We could have done something. 40. We didn't have that kind of money. So they sat at Denver International Airport for three years. We paid $250 a month for storage, um, and then ultimately we decided to bring them back to the museum because we weren't getting any progress. So that's 2014 through 2017, and then in 2018, remember that serendipity thing? I went to the Getty Leadership Institute at, uh, at, um, in Los Angeles, and I looked at the roster of attendees, and one of the people that was going to be in my two-week-long class was Dr. Purity Kira, Director of Sites and Monuments for the National Museums of Kenya. So I was that creepy guy at the first cocktail party who goes running up to a woman who doesn't know who he is and says, hey, we got to work together. And she says, whoa, what are you talking about? And, but we agreed to work together. And she went back home and over the next year worked on the Kenyan Revenue Authority and then got them to waive the $40,000 import tariff. And within a week, these Vigongo were on their way home. There they are, arriving at the National Museums of Kenya. Fully created, all of that. There's the National Museum of Kenya staff checking out the, the packing that we did and so on. This is in Nairobi. The Vigongo ultimately go then to the Fort Jesus Museum in uh, Mombasa, which is um, a Portuguese fort, 13th century, 14th century Portuguese fort, but it's the National Museum of Kenya outpost, most close to Mijikenda land. And this is their conservation laboratory. That's uh, Fatma Twahir, who is their conservator, who also had experience working at the Getty, getting trained at the Getty. And those are the Vigongo that came from DMS. Those are the ancestors that came from DMS go back to National Museum of Kenya for ultimate distribution back to the Mijikenda themselves. So um, later after those arrived in July, I went over to Kenya just to get some personal closure, frankly, and to celebrate, but I needed some closure to say, I'm sorry, folks, that my museum was complicit in the theft of your ancestors, because we were. We held them for 30 years, never displayed them, had them as accessioned objects. We were complicit in that trade. This is Dr. Purity Kiura here. Um, this is Jimby Katana again. This is William Saka. Both of these guys are National Museum of Kenya employees. They are both also Mijikenda, and they're both still active in this work, as is um, Dr. Kiura. And then the Mijikenda elders with whom we were working, um, and we went and had ceremony. These are my sons in taking part in the dances, in the ceremonies, in the, in the feasting, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I needed closure. I think the institution needed closure. We needed to go and be present in their terms, on their terms, in their territory to participate in this, in this closure aspect. In 2021, I had the privilege of going back to Kenya with National Geographic photographers, and the, the Vigongo story was published a little bit in the March issue of National Geographic of this year. So I went back and introduced them to the Mijikenda elders, and this is my photograph showing that... Um, Vigongo 
erection and, and honoring is still a part of Midji Kenda culture. It's not a dead portion of their culture. They're still actively doing this. Uh, here's another one that's inside a shed. These are analogous to Vigongo, but they are um, for not quite as important people. Um, but you can see these things are beautiful. They are erected. They are still part of the cultural landscape for these people. Here's another out on the homestead. Um, and these are living aspects of their culture still to this day. And there is Festus, uh, Festus Tinga. This photograph was published in National Geographic, um, and there are his uncles. Remember that picture of the cage and the men standing in it? The entrance, so that photograph was taken from the other side because the entrance is there, but when we went and saw Festus, the Vigongo were in the cage. We turned them around so that you could see them in this photograph, but there he is with his uncles whatever it is, 23 years later after they were repatriated. Still in a cage, he's perfectly happy with it. Um, it is a less than ideal situation, but he'd rather them be in a cage than be stolen again. Uh, during that trip with National Geographic, I ended up in the house of an art dealer in Nairobi who also has um, a huge house up in Aspen. He has Vigongo in his house as art. There's another art dealer in, in Malindi, which is another town on the coast of Kenya, who has Vigongo. I counted over 100 in his garage. Um, he has a much larger art collection as well, and I said to Purity, why don't you go after this guy and try and get these ancestors back? And she said, everything takes time. They're hoping that they can get a donation of much of the rest of the collection, which is also Kenyan cultural heritage. So they're okay with this. I wasn't. I saw this once. National Geographic went back to photograph them more later that night. I couldn't go. I was just, I, you know, I, I'm not doing that. Jimby was there and, and others. So they know that these are there, but technically they're private property in Kenya. Kenyan law still honors that in many instances. And then they've also got to worry about their own political context and goals and aspirations, but over 100 in that guy's garage. So this is where I turn it over to Dr. Petrello. You can tell me which one he is in that photograph, uh, or you can figure it out for yourself. There you go. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this, is, this is me with a, with a monkey. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of next steps, what, what might happen, what could happen, and what our obligations are to both um, our collaborators at other U.S. museums that we uh, went on a recent trip to Kenya with, uh, the, our colleagues at the National Museums of Kenya in Nairobi and Malindi and Mombasa, as well as um, our obligations to uh, the Mijikenda. So this is Steve and Purity at a ceremony that was held uh, for to honor the return of Vigongo from other museum collections in the United States. We went over with the Illinois State Museum, uh, representatives of the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields, as well as uh, the Wyoming University Art Museum. So it was a large group of us, all of whom are in various stages of re, uh, returning Vigongo. Some have been returned, some are on their way, and some are still negotiating with their leadership at their institutions to complete the return. Um, a lot of this work has been led by Steve and by DMNS, helping other museums negotiate uh, the sort of political and cultural differences uh, that are required to make returns such as this. Uh, that is me and Steve with the uh, governor of the county of Kalifi. Um, there are 42 counties in Kenya. Um, you can think of them as states. So this is the, the governor of Kalifi. Uh, he is himself Mijikenda, so he was also at the ceremony that was held to honor the return from the, uh, it was the Illinois State Museums. And yeah, Newfields. and Newfields. We yeah. Uh, so this is us uh, walking into one of the Mijikenda sacred forests, uh, a narrow dirt path. As soon as we got into the forest, it started uh, pouring rain, um, which is uncommon, and uh, especially rained for hours, which is also uncommon. Um, so the, the Mijikenda elders were pretty, pretty psyched about that. Um, it, was, it was damp. Um, this is at the beginning of the ceremony. Uh, people were sort of just kind of milling around, talking, figuring out what was going to happen. 
Um, these are the thatched huts. Uh, people still live in, not all Mijikenda people live in the sacred forests. Some do, some live in Malindi or Khalifi or the towns nearby. Some live in Switzerland. Uh, one of the elders uh, was uh, uh, a banker in Switzerland who came home to use his considerable success in business to uh, facilitate uh, the return of Vigongo and to sort of uplift uh, Mijikenda um, issues and concerns. So this is, uh, the, in addition to um, the, the folks from the states, uh, there were uh, both police and uh, Kenyan army officials there because there were a lot of government officials from both the, city, uh, the county of Kalifi and the Nairobi national government. Uh, there were also uh, nonprofits, uh, Mijikenda nonprofits that um, were involved. You know, they sponsored the PA system to be there, or the tent rentals, and other aspects of the ceremony. So it really was a, a, a community coming together in a variety of ways. Um, these are some of the uh, the government officials. Um, so the National Minister of Tourism and uh, the National Minister, Minister of Mining, is that his title? Heritage. And Heritage. And then the, one of the Minister of Mines was there, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure why. Um, and this is the, the County Governor of Khalifi in ceremonial garb. He was who we were photographed with earlier. Uh, and then there was a lot of speech making, um, a lot of um, people talking about the importance of the return of the Vagongo, about how much more work there is to do and what uh, can and should happen next. So really, uh, one of the reasons that we went to Nairobi, Mombasa, and Khalifi as sort of a visiting delegation was to meet with the Director General of the National Museums of Kenya in Nairobi. This, um, as more and more get returned, the Kenyan government has taken increasing interest in the continued return of Vigongo, um, and they very much see it as uh, a testament to uh, Kenyan nationalism and Kenyan national pride, as well as um, something that's of ongoing cultural importance to the Mijikenda. Um, and then we went to see the facilities where they're being researched and processed in Mombasa at the Fort Jesus Museum. And then we also went to Malindi, to the Malindi Museum, to see the facilities there where the folks at the National Museums of Kenya are hopeful to build a collection storage space where returned Vagongo can be researched and processed. Um, but then once that work is done, they can then use that space as permanent collections and archival storage. So this building is a 19th century uh, British colonial office. Um, uh, and this is kind of uh, where their permanent collections of the Melindy Museum are exhibited. Uh, and this uh, is their collection, current collection storage facility. Um, so it looks a little bit different than Avenir. Uh, this is a padlocked closet on the exterior veranda of the building. Um, they have a passionate and committed and really talented team there. They just lack the facilities to care for the collection and do the kind of research that needs to be done on the Vigongo to continue identifying the sacred forests from which the Vigongo come. And that's the next big step. So this is an exterior space behind the museum where they hope to build this facility. Um, so we were brought in to look at the space and to start having conversations about ways that we can facilitate not only um, trainings, uh, workshops, uh, you know, intellectual exchange between the Melindy Museum and the U.S. institutions that have returned the Vigongo, um, but also kind of uh, give um, workshops on museum best practices to staff over there, hopefully. Um, so there are a number of possibilities for this project going forward. And this is the, the, the team of folks uh, who are working on this now. So on the left in the front is Doris. She is the curator at the Melindy Museum. 
Um, and then everybody, and then on the, in that first row on the right is Othman and Purity, who are kind of, are really key, key interlocutors on the Kenyan side of this, both work for the National Museums of Kenya in different roles, but um, really helping us navigate and negotiate the sort of, the things about Kenyan politics that we don't know, uh, which is always um, something to be mindful of. Should we give him a hand? Um, <clears throat> stay up. Um, so, um, concluding thoughts. Voluntary returns in the museum world are becoming increasingly common. Um, 10 years ago, this was not the case. People would go to museums, particularly in Europe, uh, and say, hey, that's sacred to us. Would you give it back? And they said, nope, it is against federal, it's, it's against national law. And then in 2017, 2018, Emmanuel Macron, the prime minister of France, gave a big speech and saying that France was going to actively engage in voluntary returns. And then George Floyd's murder and other things happened in the last few years, and the landscape has changed entirely. So they're becoming more and more common. They're based on moral, and ethical, and common sense reasons, not necessarily legal ones. Um, and this is good because the law oftentimes sets a fairly low bar, as we discussed in our v uh, re NAGPRA presentation uh, a month and a half ago. There are 85 Vigongo that have now been returned. The 16 from the University of Wyoming are hopefully on their way, but the University of Wyoming Art Museum, no museum in Wyoming has ever deaccessioned anything. And so their, their um, in-house attorneys are kind of wigged out by the whole prospect because it's a precedent. Uh, what is that? Well, and I say, well, what's the precedent with doing the right thing? What's wrong with making a precedent by doing the right thing? There are still more than 300 Vigongo in U.S. museums, and we're working to try and influence some museums to return them. Hampton University, which did a great job by returning one 30 years ago, still has 98. Um, there's at least that many in private hands, and there's no way to track, how, uh, track where those are and who those are, but I can guarantee you that that gallery in Los Angeles sold way more Vigongo than ended up in museums. And we're going to keep working on this because um, what we found is it's about relationships. You can have the right idea in 2007, 8, 9, and it takes a decade until the right relationship is set up. We have set up that relationship. We have established a, a precedent on a practical level because a deaccession for a museum shouldn't be a threat. It should be an opportunity. Um, but many museums are so versed in the collect and preserve mantra that they can't even conceive of what it looks like to deaccession something, to give it back, um, even if it involves the curation of people's souls. And again, some museums still these th see these things as art. We don't, but we're going to keep trying to persuade other institutions um, to do what we believe is the right thing. So we have time for questions, thoughts, comments from all of you. We have the cube of the question cube. And we are happy to, to hear from you all. So thanks for your time and attention. Does this work? Yep. Yeah. Um, I applaud your work. Really great stuff. Um, but I'm curious about the provenance data. So for any Vigongo, whether they're in a museum or in private hands, like in that garage, um, 100 plus, um, are there provenance data with them so the Vigongo can actually go back to individuals and, and serve as their renewed ancestors? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there is, we, have a document, we have documentation in the accession files here at the museum which lists two donations, one from Gene Hackman, one from Art Linson, 18 and 12 Vigongo, and then it says which homesteads they came from. Um, the problem is as I mentioned, only seven of the nine um, Michikenda tribes make Vigongo, and the list includes two of the tribes that don't make Vigongo. So it's entirely possible that the, art, that, the, that the provenance was lost in transit or was disassociated from these things, and then somebody made it up, as happens with art objects a lot. Somebody made up provenance to make them seem more um, uh, authentic or something like that, to give them a location. The other thing is, is that the people who made them, the people who carved them, are now oftentimes deceased. But we're going to work. Do you want to work on talk about what we talked about there with these folks? 
Sure. So, I mean, one of the ways in which the sort of repatriation research is is done is uh, through historic images. So if you can find images of homesteads or images of sacred forests that have Vigongo in them and match them, that's one way of adjudicating the pro the provenance data if there is any. Um, the other aspect of this is that um, carvers were um, not copying um, patterns or forms. They were sort of individually creative and people recognize the sort of individual uh, artistic idiosyncrasies of some of the carvers who made these Vigongo. Um, so that's another way of tracing where they may have come from. Um, so I think it's about using that kind of composition of, of potential data to, to make a, a not a best guess, but uh, an informed, an informed uh, provenance identification when it comes to location. And that's really what the folks in Kenya would like to do at this facility in the Melindi Museum is make it a space to process and research and identify the, um, the originating communities for the Vagongo. Yep, and one of the things I should have added as well is that we're working to help them create a facility at the National Museum uh, of Mal and Malindi here, um, but then the ultimate goal is to create a cultural heritage zone in one of the sacred forests where the Vigongo get re-erected out on a landscape. Clearly, if they can go back to an individual carver homestead relative, we would do, they would do that, but if they can't, they would go into a collective facility that can be protected, that can be honored, and in which the, the Vigongo can continue their spiritual journey. But that's a longer time prospect. And the governor was just recently elected. He's got four years left in his term. It's not to say that work wouldn't happen after the four years, but with a Midji Kenda governor, remember the county is not just Midji Kenda, it's lots of folks, but the current governor is Midji Kenda. That provides an opportunity to get some things done on the political level. More questions? Nobody? Really? Okay. Hmm? Yes. Ah, well, I knew Jennifer. <laughs> Hi. Um, could you speak to us about just this, the, the usage and spiritual connection of these? I'm reminded of the kachina that we had um, up in the Native American Hall and how we redid that display because the displays we had it, which had to do with the carving and so forth, was really, uh, we learned inappropriate to the Kachina. Um, and so it's really interesting to hear you discuss about the carving of them and also about these as a manifestation of souls. Could you just talk a little bit about, about how those come together? Um, I can in a, in, a, in a very general way in that, um, and John Domboski just sent me an article from Science Magazine in the last two weeks about the issue in Western society of compensating other cultures for loss. And Western governments and organizations are getting better at compensating people for loss or damage if it can be quantified in a monetary sense. And one of the things that happens with indigenous populations around the world is that their relationship to, for lack of a better term, objects is, is far more animate. It's far more involved. It is far more spiritual. It is, it's not just a possession. It's a living thing that is part of this worldwide community, um, or at least connection between people and nature. And so the, these are, are not just manifestations of a, a person's um, relative. They are also part of this living cultural landscape that once violated can have really, really, really nefarious implications all the way down the line. And if you talk to Midjikenda, they will say after Vigongo were stolen, their crops failed, their cattle died, their, all of this kind of stuff. And I could look at it as a scientist and say, well, we could attribute that to climate change because look, the timeline is exactly the same. And they would say, well, climate change is happening because the Vigongo were stolen. So um, I don't want to I, I, I want to get too much in detail about the Vigongo necessarily, but to to say that Western conceptualizations, understandings of the world are very, very different in terms of exploring what the relationship is between an object and and everything else, for lack of a better term. Um, and so, yeah, that Kachina doll that we took off display, somebody told us, a knowledge keeper, an elder, an, uh, an expert told us it's inappropriate for this reason. We will listen to it and we will make accommodations for that. And the return and this ongoing work is made in that spirit. But 
these Vigongo are also, um, like other objects that we repatriate or return, they're very, very powerful. And some people are uncomfortable with that power because their spiritual journey has been violated. Um, so in some repatriation situations, return situations, we will repatriate objects to a given nation and they'll say, or museums will repatriate, and then they will say, museum, you keep it because it's too powerful to come back here. Um, does that sort of get at what you were thinking, Chris? Did you ever respond? Yeah, I mean, I can just also add that part of the ceremonies wa, uh, were private and not for everybody who was in attendance. So Miji Kenda elders um, uh, separately and privately before the public celebration started um, purified the Vigongo um, to uh, ensure that they could return safely to the the sacred forest um and and enter without causing harm to anybody who was in attendance so i think that you know that it's not uh i guess um the one thing i would say about a lot of returns or repatriations that is it's not transactional that it's not simply just the the legal restitution or the sort of redefining their legal status it's also about doing what's best for the vigongo and for the community um in sort of culturally appropriate ways and the fact that the heavens opened up when we set foot into that sacred forest could be called coincidence. None of the elders, none of the Mijikenda believe that at all. Well, I mean, we stepped foot, not we, the whole entourage. So it wasn't, it's not about me and Chris, it's about the whole delegation. Steps foot into that forest and the heavens opened up and everybody said, this is a blessing. It's kind of hard to argue with that in that context. I'm on my way. <laughs> well, we're recording it, so it's good to... Thank you, Paula. Um, I just had a quick question. I'm curious, what's the likelihood of an art dealer working with museums, working with these communities to repatriate? Um, curious if that's ever happened in, in you all's experience. Um, it sounds like that is a hard relationship to mobilize. Clearly, you know, some of them are not here for repatriating, but I'm just curious if you've ever had that experience where someone decided to give those items back. Um, I will say two things and then turn it over to the guy that worked in an art museum for a long time. Um, I reached out to this guy again. He's got a house in Aspen. I emailed him. He didn't email me back. Um, and our record on this repatriate, on this return is published. He knew what was going on. He's a busy guy. Maybe there are other reasons he didn't get back. And this guy, while we were having drinks in his, in his hotel complex, just let it be known that his position was not involved. He was not interested in returns or restitution or any of that kind of thing. That's an N of two in this one particular instance. Um, but Chris, what do you think? I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's impossible, but I would say that it's probably uh, unlikely. I mean, I think even lots of museums only return things when they are legally compelled or required to do so, and there's an overabundance of evidence that they have to. Um, so I, you know, for people who have an ethical or moral obligation, but not necessarily a legal obligation, um, I think that's a bit of a challenge. And then, you know, um, there's also, there's so many differences in the ways in which art dealers operate depending on the type of art that they move through the market um, and you know African art and the trade in African art and 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 so-called antiquities is um, very very complex and very complicated with lots of you know known fakes and forgeries also circulating as part of this market so it's 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 a it's very murky waters when it comes to 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 African art um, and material culture. There's a documentary called In and Out of Africa, which is all about the trade in um, in um, mostly carved wood antiquities and, and and the relationship between the middlemen in the marketplaces in Africa and the you know the art dealers in New York or Boston or L.A. who 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 move them into the into the market it's really interesting i would i would check it out if you want more information about how complicated the the world uh, private world of african art is and um a follow-up on all of that and the market is that the destitute young probably men who cut these things down and took them from the various homesteads 
were paid seven, 10, $15 per Vigongo. And by the time they were sold at the art gallery, they were going for $4,000. So there were lots of people down that line who were making lots of money off of this, um, but it wasn't the Midji Kenda. Um, a follow on thought for that is some people have said, well, what if you give these back to the Midji Kenda and they turn around and sell them um, back out into the private market? And our position was that is just fine because we were in possession of stolen property. We never had legal title to these things in the first place, not to mention their people's ancestors. But if the Midji Kenda really wanted to do that on their terms, that, you know, we have to be okay with that, and we are. Um, so it's, it's complicated, lots of different layers on this, and we do what we can as we move forward with institutions that are ready to move forward. Thank you. Uh, this is an awesome presentation. Thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, I'm curious about how the Mijikenda interact with the Vigango in modern culture and how they view, I, you talked a little bit about the, the power that they hold, the sacred nature of having them. But I see in this picture, you know, they have some um, fabric tied on them. It looks like the paint might be fresh. Could you speak a little bit, if it's appropriate, to share about how the modern culture and community likes to, um, how they interact with them, if they're more like, I don't know, like a gravestone where they're there and they're a marker. Is it a prayer site? Are they part of certain ceremonies? If it's appropriate, I'm just yep. curious. It's, it's a great question. They're not grave markers. Um, and so there's not really an analog for these things in Western society. But the reason I pointed down here is that these guys were feeding and speaking to their ancestors um, while we were there. Um, they were doing it in this installation. Um, and, and this one is here. I've got video and with permission, of course, of guys here. You can see the same ladle device here, but giving water and food to their ancestors. This is very much an active part of, of their culture. And if you read Ernie Wolf's book from 1990 about this, he will say that this is, it's no longer part of their active culture in 1990, but that made it easier for him to take these things. Um, it's very much an active part of, of, of some Midji Kenda's lives, right? The young folks that we were talking to had the sound systems and all that kind of stuff. There's like any community, there's a disconnect between elders and, and young folks. And it's concerning to the elders and it's concerning to some young folks, but it is an active part of Midji Kenda culture still to this day. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, gosh, okay. We'll take a couple more and then, and then call it. Hi, um, so I was just curious, but do you think this, uh, this kind of like attitude will be applied towards other fields of anthropology and archaeology with uh, human remains, like I was thinking of like mummies mm -hmm. within the next like near or even like distant future of uh, returning human remains back mm -hmm. to where they came from? Um, yep, great question. NAGPRA, North American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, was passed 33 years ago. Um, museums are coming along, um, dragging their feet in many instances, um, and so going, doing repatriation under legal auspices. Um, we decided 15 years ago that we were going to do it under moral auspices, not just legal. So it is all over the map. If you haven't seen the ProPublica article from February, go online to ProPublica.com and there's a deep, long dive into this issue. You mentioned Egyptian mummies. We've talked about the Egyptian mummies that we have on display upstairs. Um, we talk to and work with source communities to find out, the source and descendant communities to find out what their relationship is to their ancestors. The Egyptians have not asked for those back. They don't mind having them on display here. Michelle Coons, who is back over there, is active with the Peruvian community. Um, and, and we don't have any Peruvian ancestors, human remains in the building, um, but we're actively involved in those kinds of discussions. Um, the, the discipline is headed in that direction. And I should say that there's also still a large space for researching archaeological research, physical anthropological, biological anthropological research on human remains to learn. And there is an ethically grounded um, aspect of research there that Dr. Erin Baxter can tell you more about. She's right back there. Wave, Erin. There she is. Keep it up. Um, so there's lots and lots of depth and nuance to it. That, but the, one of the frustrating things is that m many museums have dragged their feet. We've had 30 some years to, to address Native American ancestors in the collections, and many of them haven't do that. But we can keep talking. The landscape is shifting, um, and um, we can find museums that are, have, that are all over that spectrum of, of possibilities. Chris, anything on that one? OK. Courtney. Hello. Hello. Um, 
having heard the NAGPRA presentation you did a, a bit ago and this one, I'm under, I'm getting the impression, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that the repatriation we've done to places in, to people in North America and this, this is taking more time, more commitment, like you're learning so much more about this individual culture than you necessarily do for all, a lot of the other ones in North America. So then as you go forward looking at other objects in the African collection or the South Pacific collection and anything, how do you, how do you see that as like, it, that seems like a really big thing if you then are gonna have to replicate this entire process with something from the DROC or something from Ghana or something like, how's that gonna go? <laughs> and I don't think it's gonna be bad. I'm just wondering, like, this, it seems really big. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it is. I mean, I think it, 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 it will be challenging and, you know, you don't know what you don't know, pardon the, the triteness of that. Um, but I think um, this has actually been a really good like learning experience for me since I've been here and I'm assuming for you since you started this Steve that um, there is a path forward and there is a way to do it and the easy you know the easy solution is be well it's too complicated and you know UNESCO would like us to you know participate in international terms but we don't have to right so I think um, you know as we move through the collection and if we come across collections that have similar um, concerns, then we'll just have to use this as a model for, for making those connections and knowing that we shouldn't send anything unless we know about the tariff situation, for instance, right? So maybe it'll get easier and easier. Um, and then, you know, sometimes international, you know, non, non NAGPRA related returns or non legally binding related returns can actually sometimes be a little bit more straightforward. Um, so there's also that aspect of it too. So that yes, th th these ones are particularly complicated, but some of them are actually relatively straightforward as well. Not that the law makes things unnecessarily complicated, but there's process. You know, there's very specific processes that one needs to follow when returning something via NAGPRA as opposed to internationally. And one of the things that, just to be clear, yes, it took a long time. The work proceeded in fits and starts, and there was lots of downtime in the middle of, of all of that. And the Vigongo are the exception that proves the rule. It was clearly so egregious, so anomalous, um, that, that it was worth addressing because they're souls, because they were stolen, because all of those things. And then many of the other collections are singular objects or other kinds of things, and it, it is going to take a lot of time. The one thing that I would add, um, and maybe this is a good way to wrap up, one of the, in addition to the um, personal and professional, um, I don't know what the word is, um, goodness that I have felt through, all, through achieving this, is that two and now three different institutions, one, a government-run um, museum that was shut down during a previous governor in the United States. The Illinois State Museum was shut down by a previous governor because of lack of funds. The current governor opened it back up. They were able to, to deaccession and repatriate using our work as a model. The Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields, a public institution but an art museum, was also able to deaccession and send theirs back using our work as a model. Now the University of Wyoming Art Museum is engaged in it. Each one of those institutions that has had different internal challenges by their own bureaucracy, by their own nature bylaws of their, of their own institutions, and yet they were able to point to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, a private museum, um, you know, it's on public land, accepts public money, but, but it's different from them in a natural history museum. They were able to point at us and say, that's the example, you know, they did it, why can't we? And we hope that this is going to, to, to accelerate a wheel in the future to get those other ancestors returned to the Midji Kanda. Um, but it's, yes, it's complicated, yep. and it takes time. And it takes relationships, right? I mean, it just does. If I hadn't have gone to that conference in LA, this might not have happened. So I think before we thank uh, Steve and Chris, two reminders and one pitch. One reminder is September 5th, 1 p.m. is uh, Dave's lecture in Madagascar. The other reminder is that these lectures are being recorded and uploaded onto the DMNS YouTube channel. So let your colleagues know that if they missed any, you can see the ones they missed. And this one will be, it takes about two weeks to upload them. And one pitch, anybody from the science Division, uh, we have openings 
for several more lectures uh, before the year ends. So if you're interested in giving a lecture for the science pop-up lecture series, all you have to do is email me and we can find a date for you. So with that, I think let's thank Steve and Chris for a great lecture. <laughs>